Chapter 11 is about emotional behaviors and what is going on with us internally when we experience different emotions. So according to psychologists, an emotion is based on cognition, the way you think about something, an action that takes place, a feeling that occurs after you've had a certain thought, and some type of physiological change that takes place in your body. So when it comes to your emotional expression, there is autonomic arousal. These are um, emotional situations that arouse your autonomic nervous system. They can evoke a combination of responses in your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. There are many different theories of emotions. So one of them is the James Lang theory. James Lang suggests that our autonomic arousal and our skeletal actions occur before an emotion takes place. So he says that our emotions are felt as a result of the label we give the arousal we feel. So something happens, we think about what's happening, we engage in a behavior, and then we express a feeling. For example, let's just say you get married. You think it's great, I'm so glad I found the love of my life, it makes you smile, it makes you cry, it makes you cry, and you can infer based on your actions and what you're thinking that you are happy Doesn't James Lang's theory leads to two predictions that people with a weak autonomic or skeletal response should feel less emotion. And if a person's emotions, um, if we increase the response, that should enhance an emotion. Different research that's uh, been conducted to tell whether or not this is true show that paralyzed people report, report feeling emotion to the same degree. Um, that they experienced emotion prior to their injuries. So this pure autonomic failure is the idea that output from our autonomic nervous system to our body can fail. And people with this condition report feeling the same emotions that they felt before, but less intensely. That tells us that other factors are also involved in our perception of emotions besides our autonomic nervous system. Many people also receive Botox treatments. Botox blocks the transmission um, of messages at various synapses and at your nerve and muscle junctions. And there are people who've had Botox ingestions who say that they have weaker than usual emotional responses after they watched a short video. This tells us that our body changes the body changes that we go through are an important part of feeling an emotion. So people with certain types of brain damage can also show normal ero emotional responses. So if we think back to James Lang's theory, an emotion, emotional feeling results from the body's actions. So a person who experiences a panic attack has activation at their sympathetic nervous system. They have sweating, increased heart rate, fast breathing, and that is only perceived as they experience that sympathetic nervous system arousal. That's the only way a panic attack happens. So if we create certain body actions, we can slightly influence our emotions. For example, smiling slightly increases happiness, Inducing a frowning, a frown can lead to a slightly less pleasant experience. This tells us that what's going on with our body actions does play a role in how we experience emotions, but those body actions may not be required to actually feel an emotion. So an emotion is usually considered a coherent whole, but it does have more aspects like the thinking, the feeling, and the actions. All of these things work together. Our emotions are expressed in the part of our body known as the limbic system. This is where um, 
various areas of our forebrain that surround the thalamus can help us experience an emotion. And there have been a number of imaging studies that tell us that these areas of the brain are activated during an emotional experience. So there's also been a lot of research and brain imaging studies that show us that there's no strong evidence um, that shows that there's localization of one particular part of emotion. So we know that there's no area that's critical for emotions in general, but there are many different areas of the brain that can be activated when you experience different emotions. So it's not just that one area is gonna cause you happiness when one area is activated, you can experience happiness in a number of different parts of your brain. So emotions are in the same uh, category that um, they're all lumped together in one part. So Lisa Barrett said that there's nothing in nature that may, makes weeds any different from flowers. I know that my botanists don't want to hear that. Um, we perceive weeds and a social construct like an emotion as two distinguishing factors. And she said they're actually just the same. They're just one category of things that are alike. The main support for this idea of what she called basic emotions is the fact that our facial expressions uh, for happiness, sadness, fear, anger, um, they're all the same no matter what. We are rarely going to interpret our emotions based solely on a facial expression because we know that you can have two or more emotions pre present even though you have just one facial expression. Gesture and context can also be important. I mentioned before, you know, if you're at a funeral and you're crying, that that is different than being at a wedding and crying. And you could also have an alternative view that emotion Emotional feelings can vary on different dimension, dimensions, weak to strong, pleasant to unpleasant, um, approaching versus avoiding something. The behavioral activation system is an area in the left hemisphere of the brain, um, particularly in the frontal and temporal lobes. These areas are marked by low to moderate arousal and a tendency to approach people. They can cause happiness or anger. It's also associated with increased activity of the frontal and temporal lobes of the right hemisphere, which is responsible for our ability to maintain our attention and be um, awake, aware, and alert, um, to inhibit various actions and the stimulation of um, the emotion sphere and disgust. So what is the point of our emotions? Our emotions have an adaptive value. When you fear something, you learn to escape. If you're angry about something, you might go on the attack. So our adaptive value of some emotions can be less obvious than others. They are going to help, our emotions help us communicate with other people and understand the needs that other people have. And it can also help us in making good decisions or quick decisions. So there was uh, something called the three moral dilemmas which had to do with um, what decision people would make um, in a situation of a train accident. So when it comes to making important world decisions, most people are going to pay attention to how the outcome will make them feel. Because when you make a moral decision, your prefrontal cortex and your uh, cingulate gyrus are all um, activated and you know, a lot of people, when they make moral decisions, they're not making them rationally. Um, the decision just feels right. And then the rationalization usually occurs after the feeling. So in this three moral dilemmas, um, there were different scenarios people could choose. They could, A, would you divert a runaway train so that it kills one person instead of five? B, would you push someone off of a footbridge so the runaway train kills him instead of five others? Or would you push someone off a sinking lifeboat to save yourself and four others? And many people would choose whatever feels like the right decision to them. 
damage to part of the prefrontal cortex, which is what helps us make decisions and engage in executive functioning, can blunt a person's emotions. It can abear, impair your ability to make decisions and lead to um, impulsive decision making. Damage to your ventral medial prefrontal cortex can also um, show inconsistent preferences and a decreased feeling of guilt and trust for others. When it comes to our attack behaviors, people are going to attack and try to escape, engage in escape behaviors and those emotions of anger and fear um, when they feel they're in a situation of fear or anger. They're closely related physiologically and behaviorally. Attack behaviors will depend on the individual and the situation. There is an example of if there is a hamster who has an intruder, um, the initial attack causes activity in the corticomedial area of the amygdala, which we know regulates our fear, our fight and flight responses. This is going to increase um, the victim hamster's probability of attacking um, when they're faced with a subsequent attack because that area of their amygdala is activated. So it's about survival. When it comes to um, heredity and the environment and violence, individual differences in aggressive, violent, and antisocial behavior can depend on one's heredity and their environment. So we know that nature and nurture both play a role. When it comes to the environment, if a person has been the victim of or witnessed violence in their childhood, they might grow up to be more violent. If you live in a violent neighborhood, um, research has shown us that abused children are more likely to express violent behavior and being exposed, exposed to um, lead can harm the development of the brain and lead to violent behaviors as well. When it comes to our genes or our nature, We've had lots of twin studies that show us that there's a big amount of heritability um, when it comes to aggressive behavior. So there still seems to be a high interaction between the genetics and the environment and how a person was raised. So if there's a low, if there's low activity um, in the MAO gene, then that could lead to aggressive behavior as well. Male aggressive behavior is heavily dependent on testosterone. Young men have the highest rates of aggressive behaviors and violent crimes. On average, uh, men are going to engage in more aggressive and violent behaviors than women. But increasing testosterone in women can lead to increased levels of aggressive behavior in women as, as well. It could also lead to argumentative behaviors and then to various negative facial expressions. Impulsive, impulsiveness and aggressive behavior have also been linked to low serotonin levels and low serotonin release. So we remember serotonin is our mood um, neurotransmitter and there's something called serotonin turnover. So the amount of serotonin that neurons release and absorb and need to be replaced is referred to as serotonin turnover. There have also been a number of studies that um, in mice that show us social isolation can lower serotonin turnover and um, that lower levels of serotonin in juvenile rodents um, can lead to fighting as well. When humans have been studied, we have seen that low serotonin turnover um, is found with, in people with violent uh, behaviors such as arson and suicide by violent means. So we know that there's a relationship between serotonin and aggressive behavior, even though it may be a small one. We cannot use this to make predictions. We can't, of course, we're not going to make a predictive statement. We're just saying what factors could increase a certain behavior. Aggressive behavior does not also correlate strongly with one chemical because it depends on a combination of different chemicals. So testosterone, it could be serotonin, and then it could be cortisol, um, because it also inhibits aggression. So 
it depends on the ratio up the ratio of testosterone and cortisol that exists in the body. When it comes to the emotions of fear and anxiety, when a person is experiencing fear or anxiety, they're going to be um, more likely to approach, avoid, um, or express anxiety um, depending on their personal experiences with that. So the amygdala will help us with our startle reflex because it's going to help us um, engage in fight or flight. And then our startle reflex um, is going to be the fast response that happens whenever like a baby hears a loud noise or we are in a situation where we hear something that startles us and wakes us from, you know, whatever zone we're in. When most people think of the startle reflex, they think of babies. Um, it's going to be more rigorous um, if already ten if you're already in a tense situation. And it can also be used as a behavioral measure of anxiety. There have also been a lot of research studies um, with mice or rodents and fear um, associating a shock with a stimulus and animals learn to make that association and become fearful um, after that signal has taken place. And we've also noticed that the amygdala has a number of pain fibers and vision and hearing that it's responsible for. And it can also be responsible for our fear of pain and our fear of predators and our fear of aggressive members of our same species. It can also control your breathing patterns and um, help you get yourself to a, a safe situation if you're having trouble maintaining your breathing. More information about the amygdala, the amygdala and how it can control your auto, autonomic uh, fear responses and your ability to approach or avoid others. So when a person has been attacked or experienced a very fearful situation, that can um, become the way they experience a number of other circumstances. They might become overly anxious as a result of that because of long-term generalized emotional arousal. The clover bussy syndrome occurs whenever there's been damage, damage to the amygdala. And this, this was a study that was conducted um, in monkeys and they displayed less than normal fear of snakes and larger and more dominant monkeys. They had impaired social behaviors so um, they didn't really know what to do when they feared something. And then non-damaged monkeys um, were showed activity in their amygdala and they were able to show fear. So this tells us what an important role the amygdala plays in our ability to fight or fly. So MRI studies of the amygdala um, of... Um, Various species also show um, that being aroused and fearful will show on a person's facial expressions and you, people will respond more strongly to an angry face directed toward the viewer and a frightened face directed somewhere else. There is a tendency for people um, to be anxiety written and if that for that to be consistent over time. People with genes for reduced serotonin uptake have increased responses to that threat. Soldiers with an initial high levels of the amygdala response showed more combat stress. And anxiety depends on more than just the amygdala. It can also be a coping mechanism. When it comes to humans, if their amygdala is damaged, they're not going to lose the ability to express emotions However, they may not experience as much arousal when they view something that's unpleasant. So it almost stunts their emotional expression. erbach weith disease is a genetic condition that can involve calcium that accumulates in the amygdala. 
and eventually causes the amygdala to waste away. There was a case study of a patient known as SM who became fearless and um, was able to draw faces with multiple emotions, uh, but um, a fearless facial expression um, was something that was hard for her to do. She didn't really look at people's eyes and she lacked a um, the expression of fear, which can be very dangerous because fear is there to protect us. When it comes to recognizing facial expressions, the um, damage to the amygdala can impact our ability to recognize facial expressions of fear and disgust. There are a number of disorders that can result um, as a result of emotional expressions, and one of those is anxiety disorders. So panic disorder involves uh, frequent periods of anxiety. It, they're more likely to occur in women than men and in adolescents and young adults. Um, there could be a genetic component and um, it is linked to abnormalities in the hypothalamus and decreased levels of GABA. Post-traumatic stress disorder is also a disorder that is uh, based on emotional expression. This is when people have frequent uh, distressing dreams or nightmares after a traumatic event. They might have um, extreme emotions to noises or other stimuli. Um, and of course, we know that the only way somebody can be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder is if they've gone through a stressful experience that causes them uh, distress for a long period of time, usually more than a month. We know that people with post-traumatic stress disorder have a smaller hippocampus and um, that may be a predisposition for them to developing PTSD. And it's not just a war disorder. Anybody who goes through anything that they deem traumatic can develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So most um, anxiety disorders are going to be treated with benzodiazepines, um, such as Valium or Xanax, because they will uh, facilitate the effects of GABA, since um, we know that deficits in that area are kind of what causes the anxiety. It can also um, help increase effects of the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the midbrain, and other areas. Um, people might also try to use alcohol to reduce their anxiety because it affects GABA receptors as well. And um, that's maybe why some people experience alcoholism. When it comes to experiencing stress and maintaining one's health, um, behavioral medicine can play a role, but um, any type of behavioral medicines that are taken can impact a person's diet or it can be impacted it by a person's diet and their smoking ability and how much they um, exercise and what other stressors are going on in their lives. The general adaptation syndrome was created in 1979 by Sel who said that stress um, occurs, um, when stress occurs, it is the nonspecific response of the body to any demand that's made upon it. So according to the general adaptation syndrome, threats to the body are going to activate a general response within the body to the stress it experiences. So here are the three stages of the general adaptation syndrome. First, there's the alarm stage, which is when there's increased activity in the sympathetic nervous system. So if something happens and your boss uh, wants to talk to you all of a sudden, you might become alarmed. So that means that your sympathetic nervous system is activated and now you're heightened. You're thinking to yourself, why does my boss want to talk to me? The resistance stage is when your sympathetic um, nervous system's response starts to decline and um, your body starts to react in some physiological way. So you maybe start sweating, you start getting anxious, 
And um, the hormones are going to increase in your body as a result of that physiological response you're having. And then lastly is the exhaustion phase, which happens after long periods of stress. That's when the body no longer has the um, ability to fight the stress. And that's when the immune system weakens. That's when illness and disease can come in. And that's when uh, the prolonged stress can even lead to death because the, your body can now no longer fight off um, everything that it's going through. Sapolsky in 1998 argued that the nature of today's crises are more prolonged than they were in the past and therefore people um, experience more stress. And um, this is a long-term inescapable issue um, that can activate the general adaptation syndrome and lead to exhaustion. So stress activates the body in two ways. It leads to the activation of your sympathetic nervous system, which says fight or flight, what should I do? And then the HPA um, axes of the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the adrenal glands can become activated as well. And that can um, stimulate the release of cortisol, which can help to mobilize energies to fight a difficult situation. The immune system is going to help protect the body against viruses and bacteria um, that produce leukocytes or white blood cells. And then we also have B cells, which are leukocytes that mature in the bone marrow and secrete antibodies. So the antibodies are Y-shaped proteins that attach to a particular kind of antigen, which is a surface protein that are antibody generator molecules. T cells are going to attack intruders directly and help other T cells or B cells multiply. And then we have the natural killer cells, the leukocytes that attack tumor cells and cells infected with viruses. During an infection, leukocytes and other cells are going to produce small proteins called cytokines, which are going to help combat infection and communicate with the brain to inform of different illnesses. This will stimulate the re release of uh, prostaglins, which are going to produce fear, sleepiness, and lack of energy. That um, sleep and inactivity can help conserve a person's um, energy so that they can fight illnesses. But remember, if these things don't happen the way they should, then that's when the, the exhaustion phase takes place. So psychoneuroimmunology um, deals with the way experiences um, that happen in our body after our immune system is attacked. It's going to examine how the immune system influences the central nervous system. So when there's a stressful experience, the nervous system is going to activate the immune system and try to increase the production of those killer cells that can get rid of any type of infection that tries to include, come on into the body. But as the body continues to experience prolonged stress, it's going to produce symptoms that are very similar to depression. So the immune system is going to weaken. It's going to harm the hippocampus. And then, you know, the toxins or the overstimulation is going to damage those kill neurons in the hippocampus. So then your body can't fight it anymore. So when it comes to controlling stress responses, research has shown us that in studies with mice, that there are genes that can relate to being more vulnerable or more resilient and um, breathing routines, exercise, meditation, distraction, you know, taking, addressing the issue head on can all help control a person's stress response. Having a good social support, people you can talk to can also help reduce the responses in various brain areas, in, including the prefrontal cortex. Research has also shown us that people who are resilient um, tend res to respond better to stress. Um, and that can be based on genes, social support, physical health, and previous stressful experiences. Um, it's hard to investigate a person's ability to be resilient. It's usually something that maybe is innate. 
But any person who's experienced any type of trauma and come out on the other side, it's because they've been very resilient. 